is Jerry Gill. Today is October 27, 2008. I'm visiting with Dr. Michael Lorenz, uh, Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Oklahoma State University in his office on the OSU campus. Dr. Lorenz, you have a long and distinguished uh, history with, with OSU and the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, OSU undergraduate student, uh, member of the class of 1969 and the, the uh, of the uh, College of Osteopathic, I'm sorry, College of Veterinary Medicine, and uh, Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine since 2001, and head of the Center for Veterinary Health Sciences. You have a little bit of history there, so maybe kind of we could backfill a little bit and break some of that down. Can you tell us a little bit about your family life and about you know where you grew up? Uh, I was born in Okeen, mm -hmm. Oklahoma. My dad is uh, was a farmer. I'm a fourth generation mm -hmm. Okie. Mm -hmm. My great grandfather homesteaded in Blaine County. Oh, okay. and so that uh, interesting that farm is still in the Lorenz family I have a cousin mm -hmm. that still mm -hmm. farms it mm -hmm. I was actually raised north of Enid mm -hmm. went to high school at Kremlin High School and graduated from there in 1963 mm -hmm. I came to Oklahoma State in 1963 to uh, get into veterinary school as quickly as possible okay. didn't well, have a lot of resources well. and so the quicker the better okay. well, was there a certain individual or, or circumstance that, that uh, that uh, directed you towards Oklahoma State University? Well, actually I started out in high school, I really wanted to be a physician, but it didn't feel like, it didn't feel like I had the resources to make that work. Mm -hmm. And so a good friend of, the, friend of the family was a veterinarian. He wasn't Oklahoma State graduate, mm -hmm. he was an Iowa State graduate. Mm -hmm. Happened to be a classmate of the dean of the veterinary school at that time, Glenn Holmes. And so anyway, mm -hmm. this veterinarian had practiced in Enid for a long time and encouraged me to become a vet. And so that's the direction I went. Mm -hmm. okay. What uh, maybe kind of starting with your undergraduate experience, uh, Dean Lorenz? What do you what do you remember about your undergraduate experience? Uh, leadership activities, uh, uh, you know, opportunities or involvement. Uh, what are some of the things you were in? Well, unlike a lot of undergraduate students here, uh, I actually went home almost every weekend to work. Mm -hmm. And if it hadn't been for some scholarship money in the College of Agriculture and working every weekend, I wouldn't have had the money to stay in school. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't involved that much in activities on the uh, OSU campus. Mm -hmm. uh, go to school five days a week, three o'clock on Friday, go home, work a weekend, and come back to school Monday morning. Oh, what, uh, what are, you know, your undergraduate uh, curriculum, did it, uh, what do you remember about some of your courses, some of your professors that you had? Uh? Yeah. Well, I, I graduated in a class at, with a class of 26 from Kremlin High School, and uh, <laughs> one of my classmates, uh, Dan Zaladek, who yeah. people know him as a good OSU alum, mm -hmm. Dan came over to school and in engineering and I was in pre-veterinary medicine and uh, I think the most outstanding personality I ran into was a uh, woman that uh, taught uh, English composition. I believe her name was Muriel Humphreys and she really made you write and by mid-semester, first semester I was here, I was in this course and by the midpoint of that semester two-thirds of the kids had dropped out. Most of them were pre-med, pre-dentistry, pre-pharmacy. Mm -hmm. So I hung in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave me a good uh, lecture one afternoon on her philosophy of teaching. And I think that lady got me more organized uh, to mm -hmm. college life than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Had a lot of good instructors uh, mm -hmm. in my undergraduate career. I had some that weren't so great, but I had mm -hmm. some that were pretty good. Let's see, when you, you came into College of Arts and Sciences? No, I was in agriculture. 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 Okay. So I was going to say Bob Kahn was the Dean of Arts and Science at the time, right? Yeah, Bob Kahn was. He actually became president of Oklahoma State while I was mm -hmm. here. Uh, what about, uh, you know, you're pretty modest about your, your engagement, your involvement, but what about your recognition by the OSU Alumni Association as one of the top 10 graduating seniors and as the, the outstanding male graduating student from Oklahoma State University in 1967. And that was kind of interesting. Uh, I got into veterinary school in 1965. That was back in the days when you could do your pre-veterinary program in two years. And I was nearly a straight-A student mm -hmm. uh, in my undergraduate work and pretty much a straight-A student in vet school. Mm -hmm. So uh, scholarship was 
obviously a part of it. While I was in vet school, I was active in a lot of organizations and active in the uh, <coughs> Student Association, American Veterinary Medical Association. And maybe the competition wasn't so great that year, Jerry, I don't know, but it was, it was quite an honor, and I know the people in vet school were, were uh, very thrilled that one of theirs had won it. What, uh, do you have some, some favorite memories of your undergraduate experience? Oh, I think my favorite experiences were all centered around uh, OSU athletics, actually. Mm -hmm. Homecoming. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I, I love going to the uh, wrestling matches. Uh, stood in line forever for basketball tickets. Mm -hmm. so I, I got married after my first year here. And uh, I recall going to uh, Big 8 basketball with my wife, who was pregnant. And uh, I remember sitting through a like four overtime game with Kansas State or University of Kansas. University Heck of a deal. And we had this uh, guy that played defensive back for Oklahoma State. What was his name? Gill, I think. <laughs> but I, I, I had a great time. And I, I, I really uh, became a devout OSU wrestling fan. And I still am. Mm -hmm. Well, let me kind of a trivia quiz here, but who was your favorite wrestler? There were some outstanding ones in that era. Well, probably uh, Yo-Yo Yataki mm -hmm. and uh, Joe James. <laughs> Loved to watch Joe James warm up. and I like the fact that he uh, pinned, though, what was it, McWhorter or McWhorters or whatever his name was from OU, <laughs> one of their football players that thought he could wrestle. Well, yeah. Joe put him on his back in about 30 seconds. <laughs> Remember the 190-pound match? Well, Joe James would be, you know, would be warming up. He'd pull off his ear. And right in the middle of the match, you hear this, ooh, and this, ah. It was Joe James on the side. I take his warm top off. <laughs> yeah, Fred Fossard was another one of my favorites. Yeah. Fred had that uh, left arm that was uh, affected from polio, I believe. So, mm -hmm. He would bait those wrestlers with that left arm. They'd grab that weak arm, and the next thing you knew, he had them on their back. <laughs> yeah. Scary. And of course, Coach Roderick, he was a, he was he was interesting to watch him, and mm -hmm. he'd get down there and go through every move with them. So, mm -hmm. I just wish today that the college kids would come back to college wrestling. Mm -hmm. When I go watch the Cowboys wrestle now, it's really men of my age that are the mm -hmm. primary people that are there, and mm -hmm. it's just like it doesn't have the appeal with, to the college students like it once had. But we would stand <coughs> out for two days to get tickets to see the OU mm -hmm. duel here. And the odd even IDs. Yeah, odd even IDs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the food over in Bennett Hall. Living in Bennett Hall first year I was I was here. I had six different roommates in one year. <laughs> and the food was pretty good. You know, I'd, I'd get out there and particularly, you know, try to get in when the athletes, you know, the athletes lived over in West Bennett. Mm -hmm. I'd try to get out there and eat about the same time they did because they always got good food. <coughs> well, what, uh, you know, uh, how many students in your kind of move into your, your uh, College of Veterinary Medicine experience, how many students were in your entering class? There were 48 in my entering class mm -hmm. in 1965. We ended up graduating 40. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some students uh, did not make it academically. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a, three students, I think, two students, I think, that dropped to the class behind us. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, I think the professors in the vet school thought we were one of the dumbest classes they had, they had graduated. They always held a class of 68 up as as being a, a much stronger class, or like 50, I think, in the class of 68. They're gonna be on campus this weekend with their reunion, but uh, I, there, there's been members of the class of 69 that did pretty well, I think. <laughs> what, the, what do you, um, you know, the, the, the toughest class you had in, uh, you know, in, in, in the college? Well, you remember the toughest I think class? early on, probably the toughest class was biochemistry. Mm -hmm. It was taught by people from campus and, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, one of the old professors, a young professor at that time, that was helped help teach it is still here, and, and uh, I get to see him from time to time. But we had a man by the name of Dwayne Peterson who taught anatomy, who also helped us through uh, biochemistry. Uh, I, I found most of the coursework here exciting. Mm -hmm. When you're excited about something, I think learning is pretty easy. Who, did you have a favorite professor? I did. There were about, uh, not just one, there were three or four. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some really, really good professors. Uh, Dwayne Peterson, who actually mm -hmm. gave the first lecture in the veterinary school when this place opened in 1948. His sidekick, Jonathan Friend, mm -hmm. they taught anatomy. They were just outstanding. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed the heck out of Jim Brazil. Mm -hmm. Jim's still on our faculty, teaching mm -hmm. physiology. He was really, really, really a gifted teacher. 
and then there was there were there were some others too, but those are the mm-hmm. ones that, that really stand out. Ralph Buckner, who taught us uh, mm-hmm. in the clinics, uh, he was really a fine fellow and a good teacher. Really cared about us learning, and that's that's what uh, I found uh, so important. They wanted you to learn. They wanted you to be successful. Mm-hmm. What? Uh, who, who was your who was your dean at that time? Well, uh, let's see. Glenn Holmes was the dean mm-hmm. uh, when I started veterinary school. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was an Iowa State graduate. Graduated from Iowa State in 1936. Uh, he was a, a really, really good administrator. Mm-hmm. Uh, very, very strict. Uh, you knew if you ever got called up to see Dean Holmes, mm-hmm. you were in trouble. Uh, just tell you an amusing story. The uh, first semester I'm in veterinary school down in anatomy. They administered the uh, Minnesota Multifacic Personality Test. And if you've ever taken that test, you know there's some really bizarre questions on that, ex- on that test. I mean, this old farm boy sitting there looking at this, and, you know, do I love my sister? Do I kiss my sister? And I'm thinking, holy cow, you know, this is the dumbest thing. So I just randomly started going down through there marking answers. And I don't know, some time went by. <coughs> Dr. Peterson in anatomy came up to me one day and he said, uh, Mr. Lorenz, he said, uh, you need to go see Dean Holmes. He's, he needs to see you about your exam results. <laughs> and so I go up and shake him and go to see Dean Holmes. He said, Mr. Lorenz, he said, you're either a pervert or you're just a wise ass. And he said, I think it's the latter. And so the way they handled that, <laughs> they made me take that exam again in front of all my classmates. <laughs> I guess I passed it because they let me graduate. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, I guess it was speaking to graduating now, I mean, you, you're sort of glossing over this, uh, Mike. You received the Dean Clarence H. McElroy Award as the outstanding member of the senior class. Uh, what can you tell us about that award and what it, what it meant to you? Well, Clarence McElroy was the founding dean of the veterinary school as we know it today, Mm -hmm. Uh, the veterinary college. There was an attempt to start a veterinary college back in the early 1900s, and Mm -hmm. uh, the person that attempted to do that was Lowry Lewis. Mm -hmm. I remind everybody watching this that uh, the football field at one time was named for Dr. Lewis, (laughs) and to us us, uh, veterinarians, it's still Lewis Field, but that's okay. Uh, Dr. Lewis wasn't successful, but one of his protégés was Clarence McElroy. And then after the war, there were a lot of returning veterans to, that wanted to go to veterinary school, and there was a cluster of veterinary colleges that started about 1948-1949. University of Missouri school started then, Oklahoma State, uh, University of Georgia, just to name three, that started about that time. And uh, Clarence McElroy put it together. It was put together on a shoestring. Uh, all the finances wasn't in place, were not in place to make this thing work. Uh, he was a shrewd guy and uh, he uh, uh, hired some really outstanding faculty, uh, Dwayne Peterson, Jonathan Friend, uh, and, and there were other individuals here. And so uh, the, out, the person that's chosen is the outstanding member of that senior class and the way that's chosen is that's chosen by vote of the faculty and the person's classmates. Mm-hmm. And so that makes it, I think, extra special. And uh, we now have the uh, Dean Mack Club, and there's several faculty members here that have been honored with that award, and uh, we take it pretty serious. And when we bring a new person in at our awards bank, with all the Dean Mack Club come on stage and welcome that new person into the club. Great. No, so you, you got that word despite the fact that you had one, one B on your transcript. I had one B on my transcript. Do you want to share your story with us about that? <laughs> well, that's an interesting story. And uh, we had an uh, individual here that was teaching us a uh, course in uh, poultry pathology. And uh, that individual uh, uh, wanted to know how, how we liked the course. And uh, he had a, the uh, habit of telling long-winded personal stories. And class was generally about, you know, the life growing up in Iowa and how it was on the farm and a lot of practice philosophy. And we didn't get, we weren't learning very much about chicken diseases. And if I'd have known how much I'd be using chicken diseases, I wouldn't have cared very much how much he taught us. But still, I thought you ought to get a dime, you know, a bang for your buck. And so he asked a group of us one day how we liked his course. And 
I volunteered that perhaps he could spend more time talking about poultry diseases and less time about his personal life. And apparently he didn't like that very well because he gave me a B. Now, I, uh, <clears throat> I found out that I had the highest average in the class and he gave six A's. So the question is, how do you get a B grade when you have the highest average in the class? And it was uh, Dr. Peterson, my, one of my uh, mentors here at the veterinary school found out and he went to see Dean Holmes, and Dean Holmes knows. Second time I've gone to see the Dean, once because I'm a pervert, and now because uh, maybe I've been wronged by a faculty member. Dean Holmes explained to me that in everybody's life, a little rain falls, and I just need to get out an umbrella. <laughs> I felt like he said, well, bend over and use some Vaseline. But anyway, <laughs> what I learned from all of that was that if I turned out to be a teacher, I would not... I would not uh, treat a student that way, regardless of how much I liked or disliked them. But, you know, what they earn in class is what they get. So I did learn some good lessons from it. But that's how I got the B grade. Well, maybe shift you with some highlights, I mean, some special memories of your, your time in the college that you especially enjoyed. Oh, I loved it here. I really, I really had a, a positive uh, influence here. And there were people like Roger Pansiera, who's a retired faculty member now. He was one of my uh, my heroes. and. Uh, they, they inspired me to go on to academia. Uh, I was headed to practice. I was going back to Garfield County and I was going to be a, a food animal practitioner. Mm -hmm. And in the early spring, like January of 1969, I was at a meeting over in Tulsa and I was introduced to uh, two of the, the founding fathers of modern small animal medicine. Robert Kirk from Cornell and Jake Mosier from Kansas State. And people in veterinary medicine recognize those names as being, you know, two of the real giants. And, uh, Dr. Kirk suggested to me that I might uh, do an internship, and I had never heard of what an internship was. And so I, coming back to Stillwater, I'm thinking, boy, that would be neat. Go to Cornell, do this thing called an internship. Started talking to faculty here. And, had a lot of faculty that got on board and energized that mm -hmm. and uh, told me I needed to stay in academia. So I trucked off from here to Cornell and uh, it was a great thing I did it. I, uh, my wife and I say the two best things we ever did was when we went to Cornell and when we decided to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Were the winters a little colder? Winters are cold and they had this habit of uh, exploiting the young people. You know, they felt like you were there to service the the glory of old Cornell, and uh, while you're starving to death, that's kind of hard to put up with. But uh, I tell you what, I had uh, I had a lot of faculty that were uh, strong believers in what I could do, and they they actually molded me to be a good teacher, motivated me to be a good teacher, and to put that number one. What was the uh, the Dean Harry W. Orr Award that you received? Yeah, that's given to the uh, I think that's given to a second year student that has the highest academic average. It's given in the fall of their third year, I believe. Uh, Harry Orr, second dean of the veterinary school. Uh, from what I didn't know him personally, as, as obviously I didn't know Clarence McElroy. But uh, the thing that I learned about these two men, particularly Clarence McElroy, is they had a strong sense of social justice. And there was no games played. I mean, Clarence McElroy, uh, negotiated so that the women in Texas could go to veterinary school. They were they were forbidden to go to vet school at Texas A&M because they didn't take women. Mm -hmm. And so Clarence McElroy negotiated an agreement between the border regions of Oklahoma and the border regions of Texas. And so Texas women came to uh, Oklahoma State, then Oklahoma A&M. And so we're going back into the early 1950s now. Yeah. And so a man of his era to have that sensitivity for gender issues. And there, there were some other things that I can't put on film, but uh, you know, this man believed in doing the right thing and that's always been a motivation to me. Was he, uh, was he dean of the, uh, uh, dean of students, dean of men, several years at Oklahoma State University before he became dean of the college? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe he was. Uh -huh. well, my kind of turning a little bit different from OSU for a while. So you went, you went to Cornell I went to Cornell. I, I did an internship and a residency there in small animal. And then could you kind of share maybe your brief of your career after that you got back to OSU? 
Yeah, I was there at Cornell for three years, and then uh, we left in 1972, and I joined the faculty at the University of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Georgia was in the uh, midst of a total rebuilding of their veterinary college. It was not a very highly rated veterinary college at that point in time. And uh, uh, the president at the University of Georgia was a Georgia graduate, a veterinarian. And so he, he was uh, moving very quickly to try and change the whole university. And so I, I was there from 1972 until 1988. I went through all the academic ranks, uh, served as their associate dean for academic affairs. In 1985, uh, I was asked to be the dean here at Oklahoma State at that time. Mm -hmm. And I, didn't, I eventually had to turn that position down because of family reasons. And then in 1988, I went to Kansas State as the Dean of Veterinary Medicine. I was Dean there from 88 until 94. I returned to the faculty and back to clinics. I love clinical work. Mm -hmm. And I love being with the students and the uh, trainees in, in clinics. And so I went back to the clinics and then uh, Dr. John Alexander, who had been a good friend of mine for a long time, he came to Cornell about the time I was leaving for his training program. We'd been friends for a long time. I have to tell you in a moment a little story about him going to a football game at, at uh, Kansas State. I might as well tell that story yeah, now. Go ahead. Yeah, this was back when Barry Sanders was uh, playing for Oklahoma State, and I invited Joe to come to Manhattan and go to Kansas State football game. And of course, K-State was pretty, pretty god-awful at that time. It was prior to Bill Snyder coming. And so it was one of those uh, really nice fall afternoons, and by gosh, K-State gets out in front, of Oklahoma State 28 nothing. Oklahoma State can't do anything the first half. They're fumbling, they're kicking, they're just they're just awful. And so at halftime the score is 35 to 7 in favor of Kansas State. I believe that's the score. Anyway, they were way ahead. And so Alexander's about ready to truck it back to step down here to Stillwater and some lady sitting behind him patted him on the shoulder, said, "Now, now, now. We'll still lose it." And Joe turned to me and said, is that the mindset of the fans up here? And I said, wait, they might still lose it. The score ended up 55 or 58 to 35 Oklahoma State. Barry ran wild the second half, and the woman kept telling Joe, I told you so, I told you so. <laughs> so anyway, I'd really decided, uh, Jerry, that I was going to spend the rest of my life doing clinical work. And uh, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs position opened here, and uh, Dr. Alexander asked me to apply, and at first I said no. I wanted to, I, I didn't want, I did not see myself going back to administration. And so uh, some of my, uh, some of the alums down here, particularly classmates, they called me, and they didn't shame me, but they basically said, you know, what kind of an alum are you? You owe it to go down and take a look. Mm -hmm. So we did. We drove down and uh, interviewed for the position, and Going back to Manhattan, we got up to the Blackwell Interchange and stopped at a Brahms, and I told Bell, I said, we're going back to Stillwater. And the thing that sold me at that time was the, uh, the cohesive enough of the faculty here, something that I didn't really sense at Kansas State. There was a lot of bickering and turfing and that kind of stuff going on at K-State. And Here, they were a smaller faculty, but they seemed to be pulling together they knew where they wanted to go, they knew how they wanted to teach, they knew what their curriculum wanted to be, and they had just uh, decided on a new curriculum, they needed somebody with experience to come in and, uh, and uh, implement it. So uh, in August of 1997, on a Saturday, we married our youngest daughter. On Sunday, we had a reception. Sunday night, I'm in Stillwater, and I start my job that Monday and Wednesday bailed us down here in a truck with all of our belongings. And so we made a quick exit from Manhattan to Stillwater. And gosh, have I enjoyed it since I've been back. And you came as a vice president. For, associate dean. So, I mean, associate dean, pardon me, for, re, for research. For, for academic affairs. Academic affairs. Which, which is the, which is the was a job I held at Georgia. Mm -hmm. That's the job of dealing with the students, dealing with curriculum, dealing with admissions. Mm -hmm. Uh, thought I had the perfect job, and then 2001 came around. <laughs> well, um, in, in which you then become uh, interim dean. And yeah, 2001, and Dr. Alexander decided to uh, become the interim vice president for research, and uh, uh, I was asked to be the interim dean. 
and uh, I, I, Dr. Halligan came to see me, paid me a personal visit, mm -hmm. and uh, twisted my arm pretty hard because I really had some reluctance about getting into the deanship again. And so uh, I decided to do it, and I was uh, interim dean for three years, and then the administration on campus became stable, and they had a search, and then I became the uh, real dean in 2004. But I count those three years, so mm -hmm. I, I, I suspect I've done this now for seven years, going on eight. You mentioned a little bit about the co coincidence of the faculty, but of course, in addition to the, the, the appeal of being your alma mater, were there other factors that weighed your decision? Because you know you did step down from a deanship to associate dean. Well, I'd been a dean, but I was I was back on faculty. I'd already stepped down from the deanship at okay. K State. Okay, I was I back on the faculty for three years and. Um, oh, I think there was this draw to me to be reunited with people in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, I love people in Kansas. It took a while, it takes a while for people in Kansas to really get to know you and accept you. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed, uh, I was at Georgia for 16 years and my two older kids graduated from high school in Athens. Mm -hmm. uh, my youngest daughter graduated from high school in Manhattan, Kansas. But uh, Growing up as an Okie, and I use that term a lot, and I don't find it derogatory, uh, your uh, Okies are facetious. Uh, we love to twist it just a little bit, make fun of it just a little bit. Uh, people in Kansas took everything you said literally, even when you were being facetious. <laughs> Down here, people know it. You know, they know when you're full of BS and <laughs> you know, and so I've enjoyed that, and uh, what I found out has been that uh, I'm the first dean that's a graduate of this college. We've had other interim deans for short periods of time that were Oklahoma State graduates, but no dean has really been a uh, graduate of the college, and uh, that has played really, really well with the alums. And while I think it puts some additional pressure on me, it's also been a, a real help. And I've gone out and I've embraced those alumni in a way that uh, I don't think any dean in the past has embraced them. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've been really, really receptive to that. You know, the, when, you, when, 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 when you come to the end of the day and you say, what's really good about any college? Mm -hmm. It's your faculty, it's your students, and it's your alumni. Mm -hmm. And you can talk about great deans and whatever, but if you go back and really look at great deans, the, the, the really good ones are the ones that understand the strength that's in the alumni, the faculty, and the students. And you surround yourself with, with really, really strong people that have that same vision. And so our alums have, uh, have responded really, really well. I'm also known as a very straight shooter from the standpoint of uh, I won't twist it. Uh, try to tell you as straight as I can, but uh, the alums think there's been a lot of positive things that have happened mm -hmm. in the veterinary school in the last seven years. Not to say there weren't positive things before, I would never say that, but I think what we've accomplished here is a, is a, is a great warmth and openness, mm -hmm. and uh, when they have issues, they know they get addressed, mm -hmm. and they're thrilled with the response they're getting out of our hospital and out of our diagnostic lab. And we've gone from having the reputation of being unresponsive and uncaring to being warm, friendly, communicating, and man, I'd send you another case. You're really doing a good job. And that translates into people then that are willing to say, hmm, it's annual fun time. Maybe I'll write you a check, or I'll send you a student, or here's this very wealthy donor I will send to you. And those are the reasons that you really want to be out there embracing your alumni. Plus, I'm one of them. Is it, speaking of being one of them, is it special to you, Mike, to be dean before you got your initial training? It's, it's the most special thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have ever considered being the dean again anywhere else. And believe me, I've had several opportunities to leave Oklahoma State since I've been here. Been here 11 years, and uh, this is where I'm going to finish. Uh, it's just that special relationship that I have with our students, I have with our faculty, and I know I have with all of our alumni. And it's, it's just, there's just a synergism there. It works here. And finally, it's a place where when I talk about Orange mm -hmm. and the Cowboys, it's real. 
you know, in Kansas State, I'm talking about purple and white and wildcats and whatever. And, you know, I probably believed in it while I was there, but it's not like being here. And I, I like the way that uh, this veterinary school gets things done. We are not the richest. In fact, we're probably on the other end. But don't tell us no. If you tell us no, it'll happen. We'll figure out how to do it. And I just, I just love that. Not to say we couldn't do with a lot more resources, but uh, it's that pioneer spirit and uh, uh, we can get this job done. I had faculty come here from Georgia. I had a faculty member this morning. I was on the faculty with him at the University of Georgia. He's visiting and you know, their comment is, we don't see how you guys get it done with the size of your faculty and whatever. And my response is, uh, we just know how that works. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Well, speaking of that a little bit, when you, you know, <coughs> when you got here, what were some initial challenges that you faced coming back? I think the, 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 the biggest challenge that I faced when I got here was our graduates didn't like us real well. Hmm. And that was unusual. It was, it was, the Cornell graduates liked Cornell because they believed in the fact that Cornell was the best in the world. Mm -hmm. Whether that was true or not, those Cornell graduates believed it. Mm -hmm. Georgia did not have the camaraderie that uh, Cornell had. There were some issues there with alums and recent graduates and how they respected the school. Where I really saw graduates respect the school was at K-State. Let me tell you, that was campus-wide. It wasn't just in the vet school. Man, they believed in that. They were wildcats to the core. Mm -hmm. K-State, 50% of that class was out of state. And they turned those kids into the, to this loyal, we're going to support this veterinary school. Uh, I came to Oklahoma State. And what I found was uh, students that were disgruntled. Uh, they had a you owe me attitude. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, gee whiz. This is not what we got to have. And so the way I, way I attacked that was uh, making sure that the student body knew that the faculty were in charge of this and this associate dean was going to back them up. But at the same time, if the students had legitimate, legitimate concerns, they were going to be addressed. They wouldn't be swept under the rug. We would address them. But I was not going to go down and be hard on a faculty member because they gave a hard test. I remember a young man in the third year class who was well known for being very, very outspoken. He walked into my office one day and said, Dr. Lorenz, he said, here's another example of what I'm talking about. And he throws down an exam that had been given in small animal orthopedic surgery by a faculty member named Mark Roche. And I picked up that exam and I pretended like I was looking at it and I leafed through it. I laid it down and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I said, I'm going to pick up the telephone and I'm going to call Dr. Roche. And this student broke out in a great big grin and I said, you know what I'm going to tell him? I'm going to tell him thank you very much for upholding the high academic standards of this veterinary school. <laughs> and that was the last time he came into my office. Now this may seem high-handed, but students, if they respect you, will work really, really hard. And you don't have to give them anything. You know, and there's a difference between giving it and respect because you're trying to make them a really, really good doctor. And that's what I went to work on. Turning that around to where the students understand what we're doing, know that you care about them, but you're not going to tolerate a whole bunch of shenanigans, and we're going to have high standards. Uh, we went to work on improving our national board performance. Uh, that culminated in the class of 2003 having some of the highest scores this college has ever seen. 100% pass the first time they take it. They set the national average and we've done pretty well since then on our boards. And so we've turned it around. We got students today now that want to get engaged in legislative activities. They want to get engaged with uh, alumni activities. They're coming to their class reunions. We see them at alumni receptions. And so I think the difference is, is engaging them positively and being honest with them. The other thing that has helped me here is I have stayed engaged in the classroom. I refuse to quit teaching. Uh, when they tell me I'm too old, I'm too outdated or whatever, then I'll quit. 
but I was in a classroom at noon today, 90 students in there taking an elective. Uh, they don't have to take that class. Now, a class, uh, one class is uh, 75 to 80 students, so we got a lot of second year and third year students in that class. Uh, and that's helped me. It, it gives me an identity with the students. Mm -hmm. You know, they see Mike Lorenz, real faculty member in the classroom. No, you know, this man will go to the wall for him. But at the same time, if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, he can be just as tough with them as well. Mm -hmm. So I think having that re rapport with the students, uh, being in class with them, uh, has uh, been a real asset. Mm -hmm. well, what was, when, when you came here, what was your early vision for the college? And I know that's how work works sometimes, but how did you, where did you see the college going, particularly as you moved into the role? Of, well, of when the I moved into the dean's role, uh, <clears throat> At that time, what I was doing was trying to protect the college because that was a time when the budgets went south and mm -hmm. everybody was retrenching and whatever. But as I looked at the veterinary college from outside, uh, my concern was that, that, that Oklahoma State Veterinary School was a place where young people went, uh, young people got good training, young people would go to go faculty, they wouldn't stay there very long. And so my, my uh, uh, mission was how do we solve that? What were some of the ways we could make that work so that people came here and said, gosh, you know, I want to spend, I want to spend 10, 15 years here. And at the same time, you want young people to join your faculty to develop a resume so that they're competitive to go somewhere else. I mean, that's good too. But it just looked to me like there was too much turnover and particularly in the, uh, in the Department of Clinical Sciences. And then get the curriculum in rolling. Uh, the veterinary school at that time was making some moves to reestablish the research program. Mm -hmm. That was being done through an endowed chairs program. Uh, my predecessor, Joe Alexander, had been quite successful in doing endowed chairs and professorships. Uh, when I took over in 2001, there were 12 that were in place at that point in time. Uh, there are now uh, 16, so we've added four. Um, I believe in a budgeting process that's totally transparent. Uh, I don't. I'm not a dean that likes to control the gold. Therefore, I can control people through, through the budget. Uh, we have deployed all the resources, uh, and the units like that. They like that, and uh, we have great we have great communication with them. So at that point, it was to it was to uh, just stay solvent. As we moved along, we've moved along in two direct, in two areas simultaneously, and one is to continually build our research program, but at the same time, make sure that uh, we are not shortchanging the teaching program and the work that we do in our hospital and our diagnostic lab. And so we've tried some things out here uh, that the main campus has not been willing to try. Uh, for instance, uh, we did some things that provided huge incentives to research faculty. Since we provided those incentives, we've had no faculty, no research faculty leave. And my strategy was we had to become more businesslike. You know, the days of the state of Oklahoma handing us the resources we need are gone. In fact, if things continue the way they continue, you may be dealing with fewer resources, certainly as a percentage of your budget. So I had to convince people that they could go out and help themselves. You know, there was an attitude in the clinics. Well, until the state brings us more money, we're not going to do this. And my response to them was, if you see more cases, you generate more revenue. That's healthy for our students over here because they're seeing more cases. But we put a, you know, there's a practice plan. You, you get revenue because of that additional, additional salary. Uh, I believe in looking at all of your operations and saying if a, uh, if a business can do that better, let the private industry have it. Uh, we have a uh, national laboratory working in the center of our teaching hospital. And the clinical path lab, we were running it. We weren't making any money. In fact, we were losing money. Nobody wanted to run it. Da, 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 da. Put it out. National lab said, we'll bid on that thing. So today, it operates in the center of our teaching hospital, Zantech Labs Farm Road. Mm -hmm. We get samples in here from all over the United States. We've enriched our teaching because of it. 
We've decreased our costs in our college by over $250,000 because of it. And there's revenue going into the teaching hospital. So I want to look for additional uh, things that we might do that are like that. We're looking at ways of uh, changing our enrollment, maybe increasing our enrollment to get more revenue into the college. So you got to be uh, you got to be very entrepreneurial, and you got to be able to say, "I'm going to take a risk and do this or do that." You, you probably covered some of these, but what uh, achievements and innovations in the college, you know, during your tenure as dean, gives you the most professional satisfaction and personal pride? Include teaching, research, service to the profession, etc. Well, I think we've gone along uh, th three ways. One is making sure that the teachers know how highly valued they are. Yeah and putting some additional resources with the good teachers so that uh, uh, teaching can use innovative technology, make sure our classrooms are equipped. Um, uh, we've done some things with distance education where we've actually imported coursework live from sites away from Stillwater to provide elective courses for our veterinary students. I think we've one, we're one of the leaders in veterinary colleges in doing that. Uh, I really am pleased with the progress we've made in the hospital, uh, equipment that we've been able to get into our hospital. A lot of this is through private fundraising. Uh, some of it has come through revenue, but if it wasn't for private gifts, we would be hurting for, for equipment. Uh, getting all of the imaging, the radiology system digitalized, mm -hmm. getting an advanced CT unit in here. Uh, so making sure that's happened getting the addition to the diagnostic lab, which was sorely needed. Yeah. And then in, in research, it's been this, let's don't lose sight of our, of our focus here. Let's not try to spread ourselves out too thin. Mm -hmm. Let's get these areas of emphasis and let's stay with it. And one that I'm gonna really feel proud about when it's finished is that one of the strengths here for a long time has been parasitology, veterinary parasitology. It's an area that other veterinary schools have said, ah, you know, they've got all the stuff out there. We don't need to teach very much about parasitology, but that's a huge issue in Oklahoma. And we've had this strength. We got Wendell Kroll, uh, Everett Besh, who founded the veterinary school down at LSU. He was a faculty member here teaching it. Uh, Sidney Ewing, Catherine Kosan, just to name a few of some of those uh, early folks. and. Uh, what we're doing is we're raising money privately through industry to establish the National Center for Veterinary Parasitology here. And so the whole, the whole purpose of this is nationally and internationally, when people say veterinary parasitology, where do I go train? Where would I send this sample? They'll say, it's Oklahoma State. That's, that's easy. There's where the National Center is. And, We've been out trying to raise a million dollars, and we've raised about 700000 so far to get that center going. So there's a strength we've had. We've maintained it. We've made sure we kept plenty of faculty in parasitology. Pathology is another area. And so what, what, you know, I've looked at our history, our strengths, and said, okay, if you hire the right kind of people, they can motivate this. Well, we made one really good hire in parasitology. We brought one of the best teachers from University of Georgia, and she came here, she's in a chair, and she's leading this charge, and you know, we're not gonna be like Cornell or Georgia. But boy, and those things we, we choose to pursue were very, very strong. Well, maybe changing the, just a little bit the, the focus here, but how would you describe the college experience for students today, and what is, what is special about OSU that you encourage students to, to come to, to the OSU College of Oh, well, I think the greatest thing I see on this campus, uh, something that I saw when I was a student here, but uh, really uh, enjoy it now that I'm back. I'm out here on this west 40 acres, so I don't get over to uh, campus as much, but when I walk on campus, there's this uh, genuine sense of friendliness. What I tell people is when you walk on the OSU campus, and, somebody says, hi, how are you? They really mean it. Yeah. And right, I don't care whether you're a faculty member or students, students talking to faculty members or whatever. You know, we stop for our students when they're in a crosswalk. Generally, we do. Mm. People are impressed. So what do you do with your students when they're crosswalk? Well, we run over them. 
And I said, well, they're the, they're the ones that are paying your way here. <laughs> Come on. And so uh, there's a lot of things for students to do here. It's a very safe environment for, for people to uh, send their youngsters. And if you want to find out what our students and our faculty think, go to our website. And we've got little video excerpts out there talking about these are primarily faculty that got their degrees here from this veterinary school and went to Oklahoma State. Uh, telling them about the experience. Now we got some that didn't, and they bought into this OSU business as well. But if I had a crisis here this afternoon, I could walk down the hall or pick up the phone, and I would have the faculty and the administration lined up, ready to go. I mean, that's just how cohesive it, it works here. People say, well, don't you ever have people that are disgruntled? Well, sure we do. But my, our bottom line is uh, we're too small to fight. It takes too much time. <laughs> So I, I, and the campus is beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, my wife is now reading a book by Angie DeBow. It's her description about Oklahoma in the early days of Oklahoma. And she makes a statement in there that what characterizes an Okie is his constant searching for affirmation. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I find myself, when there's faculty coming here to interview them from out of state, I'll say to them, well, is this your first trip to Oklahoma? And they'll say, yes, well, what were you expecting? <laughs> you know, did you think cars didn't have rubber tires? And did you think it was all about Steinbeck and the Grapes of Wrath? And they're, uh, they're extremely complimentary. You know, the first impressions here in Stillwater in this university are really, really uh, a plus. They find the campus beautiful. We like to put them up over in the, uh, in the uh, student in the Atherton. Well, they think that's, wow, you guys got that. Then I like to take them over to the athletic hall of fame and point out to them you didn't think we were very good at athletics walk around in here for a while and it'll change your tune you know 33 national championships in wrestling help us right <laughs> what um uh, uh, how is the in your opinion mike how is the profession changing and, and what is the college veteran minister doing to address the needs and opportunities created well, that's a that's a that's a very uh insightful question uh, been huge changes uh, one has been the uh, feminization of the profession. Mm -hmm. You know, the veterinary classes now are 70, 80 percent women in most veterinary schools. And last year, the number of women veterinarians now outnumbered the number, the number of men veterinarians in this country. So women are going to become the leaders of the profession. They're going to be the practice owners. And I think the faculty, I think the uh, profession has struggled with that a bit. Mm -hmm. We should have paid attention to Clarence McElroy back in the 1950s when he said this is no issue. And I, and I think by and large veterinary medicine has braced it uh, fairly well, but you know, it brings up the issues of, of uh, raising children during school, being pregnant during school, how do you deal with it. Uh, I, th I think we've got a pretty good handle on that. The second part about veterinary medicine that's been a change has been the, uh, the rapid rise of small animal medicine and the rapid rise of specialization within small animal medicine. If you look at TV today, veterinarians are characterized as being somebody's dog or cat doctor. And a lot of Americans do not know the very, very uh, rich heritage from which veterinary medicine came. And a lot of the careers at veterinary medicine, uh, a lot of the careers that a veterinarian, uh, you know, a new graduate is suited for, you know, public health, government work, uh, large animal work, whatever. Now, <clears throat> what this, this gender shift along with this tremendous draw for small animal and specialization has created some issues that are of great worry to me and I think great worry to the profession. One, there is a shortage of young people that want to go back to rural communities and practice. There's a multitude of reasons why that's happened, okay? Uh, and in a moment I'll tell you what, what, what our strategies have been. Uh, two, there's such a draw for special for the specialized practices, the private practices. We're having one devil of time hiring faculty in our small animal hospitals, and even sometimes in equine. And, and they're making a lot more money. They have better hours, mm -hmm. etc. And so that's that's been an issue. So those are, those are the big ones. At a time when the federal government, uh, everybody says we got to have more veterinarians. Uh, the number thrown out over the next five years, a deficiency of 15,000 veterinarians in the United States. 
realizing we're only graduating about uh, 2,300, 2,500 veterinarians every year. Is, is bioterrorism a part of that this year? Bioterrorism also? is a part of that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Homeland Security, uh, USDA, mm -hmm. and veterinarians that have this unique comparative medicine education. Mm -hmm. Well, let me tell you how, how, how we think uh, you address this. And we don't think you address this by, at least for us, mm -hmm. doing anything real novel with how you train a veterinarian. Uh, we think the best trained veterinarian to enter a variety of careers is the way we've been training them for a number of years. And that is we train primary care veterinarians here. Mm -hmm. And they're very good. And the reason they're good is they get a lot of hand-on animal experience. And we don't try to cover them up with all of the referral cases and tertiary care things that they're probably not going to do without a lot more education. What we want them to do is feel really comfortable and really confident in being a primary care doctor. That's what rural America needs. That's what a small animal practice needs. If they're going to go into some of these other careers, it's going to take additional education. Uh, we offer a research experience for our students. Uh, those that want to go into research, they have a, a research track that they enter during the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, we have an NIH program that they can go in and actually start a PhD program while they're veterinarians. But the vast majority of the students coming here want to be, quote, practitioners for a period of time. Encouraging more of our students to look at uh, internships and residency and clinical training. Even if they don't come back to academia, they'll make three, four, five times the amount of money they will make is just going into a practice as an associate veterinarian. So I want the public to know a lot more about what veterinarians do other than what they see on Animal Planet. And the other big issue has been the human-animal bond. We've watched dogs and cats become surrogate kids. Mm -hmm. And that's good for the profession. People have uh, discretionary money. They'll spend a lot of money on their dogs and cats. That has really energized the specialization over here in small animal. But when you're out in rural Oklahoma, it's a little different scenario. So I think our kids are really well prepared. And I guess what I enjoy the most is listening to practitioners from other veterinary schools practicing in other states that say, you know, Dean Lorenz, I'd hire an Oklahoma State graduate before I'd hire one from my own vet school. Why would you do that? Well, they know what to do when they come out of vet school. Good. Enough said. What, uh, just tagging on to some of the conversation we've had, what do you see as, as the challenge or the, I mean, are there two or three things that in the next five, ten years out there on the horizon that, that uh, our, you know, your profession and the college here is going to need to address? I think for colleges of veterinary medicine, the issue is... Uh, seeing the funding base change from state support to state assistance. Mm -hmm. When I came here in 1997, state was probably funding 45 to 50 percent of this budget. It's now funding less than 30 percent mm -hmm. of our operating budget. So figuring out how to get those resources to keep your program going and you know how can you be innovative, how do you decrease cost mm -hmm. uh, within your program. That's a, that's a huge challenge. And faculty, the faculty issue, hiring faculty, retaining faculty, this is a huge issue for veterinary schools throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, again, there's so many opportunities out there private for these practice. highly trained people, private practice, industry, uh, government work, mm -hmm. things like that that pay salaries higher than what we are. So we struggle here to uh, be competitive with with private practice, we are quite competitive salary-wise. In fact, we lead this whole campus. If, if Yeah, I forgot about mentioning this. Is I think one of the things I'm really going to look back on was while I was dean, we made all the effort to bring ourselves to the national average for salaries for faculty as associate, assistant, associate, and full professors. And we got there. We lead this entire OSU system and where we rank compared to our peers in salary. And we made some decisions that were uh, instrumental. When times were tough and we needed to keep faculty, we cannibalized some faculty positions and took that money and raised the salary of faculty. 
and it has paid off quite well from the standpoint of how we compete with other veterinary schools. And when the campus looks at their salary base and they look at veterinary medicine, well, you don't have any issues out there. Well, yeah, we do because we're competing over here to this private side. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> what uh, What do you think, uh, looking back, Mike, and maybe we still got a few years left, what do you think will be your legacy as dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine? Well, you know, as you look back on that, I, I don't know. I, I, I would like to think it's the style of administration I brought mm -hmm. in here. Mm -hmm. It's a style that I really believe in. And, uh, you know, uh, steward leadership, I guess, uh, being able to carry on a role like the other faculty. Uh, I think the openness of the, the way we operate, uh, no surprises. I think people feel a part of that. I think that's I think that's an important part. You know, folks know this isn't a game about Mike Lorenz padding his resume because Mike Lorenz isn't going anywhere. Like Boone Pickens said last night, I've made enough money for myself. <laughs> when they ask him about the Pickens, you're still plan, working on your first billion. Yeah, that's the no, hardest. I'm still working on my first billion. That's the hardest. So, uh, what I'm really striving to do right now is I want, I want to leave that teaching hospital in better shape than it's ever been. Facility-wise, equipment-wise, uh, we need an addition to that teaching hospital. It's called an academic center. Mm -hmm. We're trying to raise money privately and with the state. We're trying to get a uh, critical care unit built for equine. Uh, that's a $3 million piece of change we've raised. Uh, about 1.3 million, got a million from the Gaylord Foundation. First gift they ever gave to Stillwater. And you see the vet schools, the, the state of Oklahoma's vet school just happens to be in Stillwater. Don't get me wrong, we bleed orange out here too. And so uh, those, are, th those are important and uh, it's so important to our faculty and clinical faculty. And then we have a research addition that needs to be built in order for us to continue to uh, expand our, our research operation. But uh, um, so I hope it just be a whole whole bunch of things. But uh, I think people say I, I, ju I just liked uh, working with him. He was a good guy, honest. Didn't keep all the money in the dean's office. <laughs> Mike, is there anything that we haven't covered that we, should, that we need to discuss? No, this, uh, having come back and worked with it, uh, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I had a great experience at Cornell, and we loved our experience at Georgia, and uh, there were lots of good things that happened at K-State, but for me personally, this is, the last 11 years, this has been uh, the best for me, and again, I think it goes back to this grit and fight, and we're going to figure out how to do it, uh, attitude that we have here. Uh, and, and I just love these students and uh, the majority of them are going to go out and going to be fine, upright citizens and they're going to be great representatives of this university and I, I think uh, there's many of them in each class that are going to be leaders, leaders in, the, in the profession. So, yep, good place. In fact, I think it's probably better than the state deserves given the small budget that they give us. <laughs> <laughs> it is the campaign season and a political announcement there. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Good. Thanks for doing this. Uh, kind of back to a couple of questions that Dean Lorenz we talked about earlier. Uh, to, to enjoy this position and to be dean and to all the challenges and quote opportunities you have, you have to have a lot of passion for it. Don't you? Would you kind of share you know, a little bit of your passion about Oklahoma State? Well, I think anybody who's around me very long realizes that uh, he's the orangest dean on campus. <laughs> has a great passion for the place, not alone just the athletic part of it, but uh, the whole the whole thing that in, in embodies this university. And, uh, uh, it comes across to people. One of the things I did early on was uh, I, I'd taken the wearing orange socks. I was going to ask you about that. Of course, I got, and I got to ask you, you know, you know she didn't have your orange tie on. Do you? no. You've already apologized for that, so it's okay. Yeah. But, if I'd have remembered we were doing this, you certainly wouldn't have on this. But it's got dogs on it, yeah, that's so that's okay. Sure. But uh, I normally have on something that's orange every day. In fact, my sport coat over there has got Pistol Pete on it. So that's the other thing. Look around my office. Look at all I, this Pistol Pete stuff. 
<laughs> out of panning right now. Well, let, let's hear the story about the orange socks. I okay, hear, the story okay. about the orange socks. Well, I started wearing them, mm-hmm. and, and uh, people started calling some attention to them. I wore them every Friday, mm-hmm. and I wore them at all athletic events. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I hit on this idea that the veterinary school needed something that was that would just sort of bind the alumni together. <laughs> so I decided that we would uh, develop this loyal and true order of orange mm-hmm. socks. And so it, I wrote a little script, and uh, it just just randomly we choose folks to be inducted into the loyal and true order of orange socks. Can, can I back up my, where did you go with that of orange socks? I mean, that, that's a little different. Where orange did socks. I get them? You know, where did you get the idea of orange socks? Well, I mean. it, it, uh, my wife knew that I had this passion for orange. Mm-hmm. And she had been up at Chris's one day, and she brought me home this pair of orange socks that's got the OSU logo all mm-hmm. over it. And I started wearing them, and people started making attention to it. <laughs> so then I get this idea, ah, you know, this could be good. Alumni want to know if I got them off. Where's your orange socks, Dr. Lorenz? Hey, Mike, where's your orange socks? So I wrote this little script, and basically it, 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 uh, the script is uh, written so that uh, Pistol Pete Frank Eaton is the person who's involved in this, and he speaks out of heaven to, to describe <laughs> who will be the next inductees into this. And, it's a neat little ceremony. Uh, we do it at alumni receptions. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do it sometimes here in the college. And the two criteria are you have to be in a you have to be an alum of the vet school. That's one criteria, mm-hmm. or you've been willing to give your last drop of blood for the <laughs> veterinary college. And so we have about 20 people in in it now. And uh, Vet Cetera, our, our college newsletter, will have a. We'll have a story about the orange socks in it this time. But when I go to alumni receptions, that's what they want. They want to know who's going to be in. People are coming up, hey, Dr. Lorenz, Dean Lorenz, do I qualify? When can I be in this thing? <laughs> and so you, 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 you don't overdo it. Mm-hmm. You want them to continually want to do this. Mm-hmm. And they'll come to these receptions. They'll have those orange socks on. They'll show them. And there's a little piece of it that says this stands for orange. Socks United. <laughs> hokey, hokey, but you know, things sometimes things like that that work. And so I'll probably be known for orange socks when I quit. <laughs> well, but the really there's a message obviously behind what you're saying and, and going back to a previous part of our conversation about engaging alumni was one of your I think one of your uh, challenges and one of your goals as part of your early own vision. Can you talk a little bit more maybe about alumni relations and some of the things you've done to engage and involve alumni in the college and to, and to get their, you know, their, their resources also? When I came in 1997, uh, this uh, rancor between the practitioners and the alums in the veterinary mm-hmm. school was uh, going full blast. Mm-hmm. And uh, development people had gone out to, with the idea, we're just going to go around and call on people and get them to donate money. Well, they got their heads cut off. Okay, and so when I got here in 97, a uh, development officer was Mary Curl, Mary Curl. and uh, she also worked with John Cathy, mm-hmm. and they told me about what was happening, and one, since I was an alum, what could I add? Mm-hmm. I said, well, let's turn this into, let's go hold town hall meetings, and when you go on veterinarian's turf, you don't let them totally run the program, but you gotta be willing to listen. Mm-hmm. Well, we started doing town hall meetings, and veterinarians are like elephants. They never forget a bad experience. You can do 10 things right, but they'll always bring up that one bad thing. And so we went out, and they had, they, they, they had problems with admissions, and they had problems with referrals, and they had problems with this faculty member. And so we sat and we listened, we didn't judge, and I knew it would talk itself out, but the fact that you're willing to go and listen to it, mm-hmm. driving back and say, how do you sit there and listen to all that? I said, look, I'm a clinician. I am used to listening to veterinarians ring me. I'm used to clients calling me a liar and everything else. I mean, it just, it just comes with the territory. And so slowly what happened is town hall meetings became positive. Because now you're out and you're talking about what you're doing. About how many of you were you making, Mike? Four or five. We're not doing very many right now. We need to get back doing them. We do about a couple a year now. Mm-hmm. 
the veterinarians say don't do them anymore, Mike Lorenz, because you're communicating with us. Okay. We've opened up the communications. We do a, a, a weekly uh, email newsletter. Mm -hmm. It's called Vet, uh, uh, Net Vet Weekly. Mm -hmm. It goes out uh, to the Oklahoma Veterinary Medical Association listserv. That thing is a weekly dialogue about what's happening in the veterinary school. So we, 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 we turned it around from uh, rancor to acceptance and listening and, and knowing that they called, it wasn't put on the shelf. You know, I have a rule here, that if there's anything I'm really staunch about, the time to talk to somebody that's unhappy is now. Not three days from now, now. Because three days from now, they're just madder because you didn't talk to them. And, so, and people have bought into this. And so if we have a problem with the teaching hospital, I'm worried about it. Mark Neer, our teaching hospital director, he handles it just like that. And that's different than the way we used to do it where, you know, maybe we'd deal with it, maybe we'd, we couldn't have done that wrong, da 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 And so uh, that, I think, with our practitioners and with our alumni and this transparency that they see, now what we've done is uh, we don't mind asking them. I was told that our alumni had no money and wouldn't give us money. That's what I was told when I came here. And I thought, well, you know, veterinarians are not very wealthy. I understand that. But the biggest donor that this vet school ever received was from a guy by the name of Sitlington. One of our alums brought him to this university. Deans didn't find him, presidents didn't find him. It was a veterinarian that graduated from here that brought Walter Sittlington to the university, and the, and the rest is history. And unfortunately, that alumnus never was given the credit for, for finding the person. Well, he has been now. And so, uh, but we have an alum that's just signed two, uh, five, two $5 million uh, deferred gifts with us. He lives in California, one of our alums. And this is not about just raising money from them. But our alumni know because they were students here. They know what the, where the strengths are. They know where the deficiencies are. They understand the importance of scholarship. They understand the importance of equipment. And I'm hearing from them everywhere. You know, how can I help? Do you, uh, do you engage them in, in terms of uh, curriculum advisement, uh, practice advisement, and things like that? Uh, we have a Dean's Development Associate Group mm -hmm. that's got several of our alumni on it. Uh, I did have a uh, committee that worked with the veterinary school through the Oklahoma Veterinary Medical Association. Uh, that committee doesn't meet anymore. They said, we don't need to. We know what's going on. My advice to them is, yeah, but if Lorenz isn't your dean in a couple of years and you get a ringer, you know, how are you going to, you know, how are you going to respond? I sit on the uh, Oklahoma Veterinary Medicine Executive Board. And so every time they meet, you know, here's this dialogue from the veterinary school. Uh, I just think we've opened it up to where we've done a much better job. Well, one strategy was we're not, we're, we're uh, a secret nobody knows about. We are going to market this place better. The university's done a better job at that, okay? So we're, we're doing that better. Uh, and constantly extolling what your alumni have done. You just got to keep doing that. And whether they're in a small animal practice in Tulsa or a rural practice in Vanita, you know, they all have something very, very, very positive to bring to the table. And if you want them to support you, you got to listen to them and, and uh, actually have the passion for what they're doing. You also have noticed when you bring them back for special recognition for class reunions, Seems like yourself as dean and, and college administrators and faculty are engaged and involved in those activities with them. We make it a point uh, we're going to be doing our fall conference this mm -hmm. weekend. And uh, bad back and all, uh, Mike Lorenz will be there to make as many of those class reunions. Mm -hmm. It's not to give them a pledge card. It's just to walk in and say, I'm proud that I'm one of you. Right. You know, and that plays well. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and you see... You see, folks, I think that's one of Burns Hargis' strengths right now is that he's, a, uh, he's an alum. Mm -hmm. They're going to accept him mm -hmm. far more than they're going to accept somebody from the outside. And you just hope you got somebody good mm -hmm. from the inside, you know, doing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully I've been good for the college. Mike, anything else? Nope.
I appreciate it very much. Thank you. you. Bet.